present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present them himself before the Lord. So um, you see sons of God mentioned there again in reference to Satan coming before um, G, uh, God. Then in Job chapter 38 in verse 7, Remember, you, you lock truth in by comparing Scripture with Scripture. That's the first rule we looked, second rule we looked at. You compare Scripture with Scripture. And the Bible has a rule that's called line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. And that's how you develop your context. When you go through the Bible in context and lock in these principles, then you can start to see a picture unfold. And it says in verse um, uh, 7, 30 and verse 7, when the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So morning stars and sons of God are the same. Morning stars and sons of God are angels. Another easy way to understand this is, of course, Satan is the son of the morning. Um, the morning star is Jesus, and morning stars are angels. Now, again, I'm just going to say this so you understand. If you have a, another Bible translation, your, the words might be different. And that's part of how Satan's causing conflict in the church, in my opinion. Because you can't even read the Bible together in church anymore. He's taken away our essence by using the Bible. We've got to be very careful because that's the first thing you ever attack with man. Yeah, yes, God says. He attacked the Word of God. And he's attacking it today. Because the book of Psalms says we're to put the name, we're to put the word of God above the name of the Lord. Now, why would he say that? Why would he say put the word of God above the name of the Lord, above the name of the Lord? Because he can change the words, he can change who the Lord is. And Satan is suddenly doing that today. He's changing meanings. And this is one of the great, when you start understanding the concept of who you are as a son of God, what that means. It's going gonna, it's gonna to revolu revolutionize how you act. Okay, so let's go to the second son of God, Adam. Turn to Luke chapter 3 and verse 38. This one's not in your notes, so turn to Luke chapter 3 and verse 38. So we, we biblically... Now, so why is it so important to say that the angels were sons of God? It's because you have scholarship today saying that angels are not the sons of God. They're saying that these Genesis 6 sons of God that looked on the daughters of men and giants were born into them? We looked at that last week. They were saying that was the ungodly line mingling with the godly line and that it was just a sin issue. Well, when you understand what it is to be a son of God and that those were angels that did this, you can see how Satan's been attacking the lineage and the bloodline of Christ and why God had to destroy the earth with Noah's flood and why he told Israel to destroy whole nations, men, women, and children because Satan had been infiltrating the bloodline of humanity to take away the line of Christ. So sons of God are angels, not just a mixture of sinful and, and, and non-sinful people. So in Luke chapter 3 and verse 38, it says, Which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was what? The son of God. So Adam was the second son of God. And I can tell you what a son of God specifically is in just a moment. But I want to walk you through this again so you understand where I'm going with this. This is not just weird stuff that I'm trying to tell you. It applies to you personally today, the Son of God issue. And the Matrix reveals it perfectly. If you've ever seen the Matrix and he goes to see the Oracle for the first time, and, and the Oracle was this entity in the Matrix that knew all this stuff, like the Holy Spirit in our life, and he goes to see the Matrix and he's talking, he goes to see the Oracle and he's talking to her. But above the door, there's a Latin uh, wood sign, Timit Nosi. And she tells him to read that sign and tell her what it means, and he didn't know. And it means know thyself. And she said, until you understand who you are, Zion's going to fall. That's the same thing in the Christian life. Until we understand who we are in Christ, that we are a son of God, endowed, endowed or endued, whichever one is correct, the Holy Spirit, to perform a specific function of creating sons of God, and I'm going to tell you what that really is in just a minute, our ability to advance the kingdom of God is going to fail. And guess what? It is failing. We're failing God as sons of God because we're not producing sons of God. I'm not talking about the entity of the church, and I want to make this very personal. 
It might, be a little, it might be getting a little uncomfortable right now. I'm not talking about the entity of the church. I'm talking about the church. I'm not talking about the, what the world defines church as, as a building. I'm talking about what the Bible says the church is. And what does the Bible say the church is? Every believer is the church. So what's our responsibility as a church? It's to win people to Christ. It's to disciple them. And I, I gave the statistic last week. If one person won one person a year, took a whole year to disciple them, and then you had two, and you take a whole year to do the same thing, in 20 years you've got over a million. There's 77 million professing Christians in America. What if we all did that? We can't point our finger at God and say He doesn't have a plan that will work. What's not working is us. We're what's not working. We're not being faithful to God's commission as sons of God. And then the third Son of God is in John 3.16. We all know that one. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, and whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus was the third Son of God. Well, Jesus came as a Son of God because for the previous 4,000 years, man couldn't do it on his own. And God did that for a reason, too. He wanted to prove to man he couldn't do it on his own. And for 4,000 years, He gave man the opportunity, you want to be independent of me? Here you go, try to do it. And they couldn't do it. They couldn't fulfill the purpose of God. They failed five and five dispensations in 4,000 years. They failed. Jesus came so that when we accept Christ as the four sons of God, we can now have the Holy Spirit living inside of us 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And there is no excuse for a believer who's in the Word of God and right with God not to make an impact in somebody else's life. You are special to God. He gave you the Holy Spirit for a purpose. He wants you to accomplish something. That's what the judgment seat of Christ is all about for believers. That's what it's all about. Gold, silver, and precious stone. There's only two things on this earth that will last for eternity, and what are they? Souls of men and the Word of God. That's what's the essence of the judgment seat of Christ. What did it do with the Word of God as it is to impact the souls of men? That's it. Throw everything else out. That's it. And... I want to do what I can to prepare people for that time when they will stand before the Lord and He's going to hold them accountable, not for their sins. That's already been dealt with. He's going to hold Christians accountable for their stewardship of the gospel and He's going to remind us of the family members we had, our neighborhood we lived in, our workplace. I try to live this way, that in my workplace, I don't, while I'm there, I don't want anybody to say, one day, if they're the great white throne judgment is where unbelievers go, the great white throne judgment, and the church is the jury, by the way, at the great white throne. I know I've said it a million times, but I want you to get that into your head. At this point, at the great <laughs> white throne, we are now married to Jesus spiritually. And we are reigning with Him. And we're going to be judging those who are coming before the throne. And our goal now should be that at that point, no one stand before the throne and look at me or you and say, man, I worked with you for three years. You're sitting there in your safe spot and you never said anything to me about Christ. You didn't even give me the chance to say no. And yet you're sitting right there. I, you know, that's what Ezekiel 3 talks about, not having blood on your hands. We can't witness to everybody, but we can witness to those in our world. And that's just as much of a, a, a missionary as someone who goes to the far corners of the earth. My next door neighbor, when I go and tell them about Christ, I am just as much a missionary as someone who goes all the way across the world. And by the way, if you can't witness to your next door neighbor or your workmates, don't ever think God's calling you across the world to be a missionary. Because he's not, if you're not being a missionary to your world right now. I think it's part of the problem we're finding ourselves into today. Half of missionaries who go to the field are coming back in four years and never to go back again. They're not ready. They haven't been equipped for what they're getting ready to do. So those are the